Have you ever noticed that when you go to a doctor's office, they seem to be very interested in the condition of your heart? I mean, come on, you walk in there, and the one of the very first things the nurse does, she slaps this Velcro thing on you, tightens it up, pump, 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 pumps it up, takes your blood pressure. And when she finishes doing that, she puts your finger on, on your wrist, and she takes your, your pulse. And, and you think you're done with the heart, but no, then the doctor comes in with his stethoscope, he listens to your heart, and he wants to see if it's a strong beat, a regular beat, a good, good beat. And you wonder, well, why all the fuss about your heart? Come on, it's just a nine-ounce muscle in your chest. What's the big deal? Well, doctors are, of course, very concerned about your heart because we know this. If something's wrong with your heart, something's wrong with you. Your heart that pumps blood in your chest all through your body is a central and critical part of your physical health. Well, in the Bible, God talks a whole lot about the heart. Not the physical heart, not that muscle, but the heart as used to describe the person that you really are on the inside. You know, people in the world, what they value the most is things. They put a premium on things, things like, you know, having good looks or or being a great athlete or having a good personality or portraying a, a great image to other people. Or, you know, we value things like popularity and talent and wealth and being in positions of, of power and influence. You know, they value people being smart and successful, that kind of stuff. That's what's really important in our world today. But you know, all that doesn't mean a whole lot to God. What he really, really cares about is your heart, is your heart. In fact, the word heart or one of its forms is found in the Old and New Testament. It's used over 955 times. Turns out that your heart is the most important thing about you or me or about anyone else you'll ever meet in your whole life. It's so important that we're going to spend an entire year talking about the topic of having a heart for God and what that really means. Now, to do that, first of all, we've got to understand a little more clearly what is the meaning of heart. We know it's not that thing that's pumping our chest, but what does it mean? I've got some definitions there. Let me share them with you. A heart, one's inner self, one's innermost feelings, thoughts, will, and intellect. The heart is the core of who we are. It's the the central, motivating, life-determining thing about you. Okay, that's what a heart is, so why is it? so important. Why should we bother to spend a whole year examining this topic of of having a heart for God? Well, here's why. Proverbs 4.23 tells us exactly why. The new NIV translation says this, above all else, okay, that's, that's pretty strong, above everything else, above all else, guard your heart. Why? For everything you do flows from it. Everything, everything you do flows from your heart. And what that means is that your heart then determines the kind of husband, the kind of father you're going to be. It determines the kind of wife, the kind of mother you're going to be. It determines the kind of employer or employee you're going to be. You know, your heart, it determines what kind of student you're going to be, what kind of friend you're going to be to your friends. And the hearts of the people in the church, that determines the effectiveness, the kind of ministry that we're going to be able to have in this community. Now, uh, the, the New Living Bible has a little bit different translation of Proverbs 4.23, but it's really good, too. It kind of helps us have an idea of what it's about. And it says this, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Wow. I mean, the whole course and direction of your life is determined by your heart. Your whole life, your whole future, your eternal destiny, everything is determined by the condition of your heart. So, it's important. So, we need to do a heart examination. And to do that this morning, what we want to do is look at the uh, heart of Saul in the Bible and out of 1 Samuel and at the heart of David. Now, Saul... He was a man whose life, it was kind of a train wreck. It was really a disaster. Saul had a lot of natural gifts and abilities, had a lot of things going for him. You know, people would look at him and say, man, that guy, he's, he's, he's going to get it done. 
But God was simply not able to use him very effectively at all. And eventually, God had to set him aside and say, I'm sorry, I, you can't be king anymore. David was a man who was certainly not without his faults. Let me tell you, as we'll see, he committed some major league sins, but God was able to use him in an amazingly effective way. David became the greatest and the most beloved king in the history of the, the nation of Israel. So you got these two guys. You got Saul and you got king. They're both Jews. They're both, you're both kings in Israel. What was the difference between these two men? The difference was their hearts, their hearts. So let's take a look then at the heart of these two guys. Let's see what makes them tick. And then the question we all want to be asking ourselves is this. At the end of the message, you're going to ask, ask you, okay, where's my heart? Is my heart closer to Saul's heart? Or is my heart closer to David's heart or somewhere in between? So let's begin by taking a look at King Saul's heart. And understand this, you know, this whole series, you kind of need to understand a little bit about where, where Israel was in their, their, this particular time in history. And what, what happens is before Saul arrives on the scene, Samuel was leading the nation. The time was about 1020 B.C., and Samuel was the last judge of Israel. And he was a godly man. He was a great leader. But Samuel was getting a little old, and he, so he appointed his sons. He was going to retire, let his sons take his place, uh, and being the judges, big mistake, big mistake. 1 Samuel 8, 1 to 3 says, And it came about when Samuel was old, he appointed his sons judges over Israel. His sons, however, did not walk in his ways, but turned aside after dishonest gain and took bribes and perverted justice. Kind of, kind of sounds like politics today, right? Pretty, pretty similar thing. So it, Israel then had this huge leadership vacuum, and their nation was really kind of floundering and not doing too well. And the people in Israel, they decided they're kind of tired of just having God over them. In effect, they were saying, hey, we're, we're tired of, of worshiping this invisible God. We want somebody to lead us that we can see with our own two eyes. We, don't, we, we want to be like all the other nations. Well, look at the Jebusites, look at the Philistines, look at the Moab. They all have kings over them. We want to be just like them. Well, Samuel's heart was broken, and he went to God in prayer, and God said, Samuel, look, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me, and it's not going to be pretty. But here's what I want you to do. Go ahead and let them have a king. And so Saul becomes Israel's very first king, and man, the people got what they wanted. You know, it looked really good at first, you know, and everybody was happy, happy, happy. Everything was rosy, but soon Saul started to unravel. Not long after his reign began, he, Samuel caught him in three very serious acts of disobedience to God. Chapter 13, he makes this bonehead decision that was just crazy. It almost cost him uh, uh, the life of his son. In chapter 14, he makes another ridiculous vow. And then in chapter 15, uh, Saul directly disobeys God, and that was the last straw. That was it, you know, to be the leader of Israel. Game over. God had to set him aside and find somebody else to take his place. What was Saul's problem? He didn't have a heart for God. He just didn't. He just never had a heart for God. Well, what was wrong with Saul's heart? Why, why couldn't God use him and his heart effectively? Well, let's examine that. Let's let, examine Saul's heart and look at five things that really uh, gave him a heart that was not after God. First of all, to begin with, number one, he had no confidence in God. No confidence. You know, God shows Samuel that, that the king was to come. You know, he had this uh, elaborate, you know, narrowing down process, and you knew it's going to, the king, this first king was going to come from the tribe of Benjamin. And they narrowed it down, and it was going to come from the family of the Matrites, and then of the tribe of the Matrites. And then it's going to come from them, from the tribe of Benjamin. And then God reveals the person in the family of the Matrites, you know, in the tribe of Benjamin, who's going to be their king. And who was it? None other than Saul, the son of Kish. Picking up in verse 21 of 1 Samuel 10, we read, Then he, Samuel, brought each family, this is the whole process, of Benjamin before the Lord, and the family of the Matrites was chosen, and finally Saul, son of Kish, was chosen from among them. Now here's where it gets interesting. But when they looked for him... 
he had disappeared. So they asked, Lord, where is he? And the Lord replied, he's hiding among the baggage. Now, that's pretty hilarious. I mean, just unbelievable. Now, earlier, you know, God had revealed to, to Saul in some spectacular, in some supernatural ways that he was going to be there. He would be there to empower him to serve as king. But here, when the time for his coronation came, the time for him to step up and be king, Saul's down there in the baggage department hiding around underneath suitcases. You know, he's scared to death. He has no confidence in God. Now, God has shown Saul, again, he's going to be with him. He's going to give him the strength. But when it's time to step up to the plate and be the king, Saul chickens out, and he's hiding behind the suitcases. Why? Here's why. Because his confidence only went as far as his own abilities. His confidence only went as far as his abilities. His real confidence was actually in his own ability and what he himself was able to do. And he knew that he didn't have what it took to be king. He knew in himself he, he couldn't do it. But instead of trusting God, instead of leaning heavily on God, having confidence in God to do it, he panics. He completely panics. He tries to hide from the task and run away from what God is calling him to do. And we see this time and time again, and Saul is just a pattern. He does. His confidence goes only as far as his own abilities. Now, it's really easy for us to sit in, sit in here in 2014 and read this story and kind of jump on Saul. Oh, man, wow, what a coward. I mean, what a wimp. How embarrassing. He's hiding around the suitcases. No wonder they didn't make him king. But you know what? Sometimes you and I act the very same way. We can live our Christian lives thinking it all depends on us. It all depends on what we can do, that it's all up to us. And yeah, sure, we can be confident about taking on that tough task at work. We can be confident about jumping into some ministry and doing it or making your marriage work or being the dad or the mom you need to be. We, we, we can be confident. Hey, I can handle this crisis as long as we feel like we've got what it takes to do it. But if it's beyond us, we feel, hey, it's beyond of what we can do. Instead of trusting God, it's real easy to just start to panic. It's real easy just to want to go run from that task and go hide out in the baggage department. Sometimes, guys, we, we say with our mouths that there's a God. I believe in God. But the way we live is, is telling a different message, saying God doesn't really exist because there's no real connection. Our confidence is only in what we can do, not on what God can do through us. You know, maybe right now as I'm speaking, you are right smack dab in the middle of some really tough situation that's just eating your lunch. And maybe it's something going on in your family. Maybe it's some kind of health nightmare. Maybe it's a severe financial crunch. And you're terrified. You just cannot solve this problem. This is beyond what you can do. And so what are you doing? You're hiding in the baggage. You're in denial. You're not really facing it. You're kind of running away from the problem. But what God is calling you to do instead is to put your confidence not in yourself and what you can do, but to go way beyond that, to put your confidence in Him and what He can do. And that's really, in a nutshell, what it means to walk in faith. Saul didn't do that. He just, he, he walked by sight, not by faith. Bottom line, he had no confidence in God. Not only that, when we look at Saul's heart, we see that he wouldn't wait on God. Wouldn't wait on God. 1 Samuel 13, here's Saul. He's fighting the Philistines. Saul has 2,000 Israeli soldiers with him. But picking up in verse 5, now the Philistines assembled to fight with Israel. 3,000 chariots. Israel didn't have any chariots. 6,000 horsemen. There was no cavalry for Israel. And people like the sand, which is on the seashore, in abundance. And they, the Philistines, came up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Haven. And when the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were hard-pressed, then the people hid themselves in caves and thickets and cliffs and cellars and in pits. Also, some of the Hebrews crossed the Jordan into the land of Gad and Gilead. But as for Saul, he was still in Gilgal. And all the people followed him, trembling, quivering with fear. Now he waited seven days, according to the appointed time set by Samuel, 
But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. All right. Let's say you're in Saul's position. Now put your shoe, yourself in his sandals for a minute. What would you do in this situation? You're completely, humanly speaking, hopelessly outnumbered. Your situation is critical. Uh, half your men are hiding in caves and holes in the ground. The other half are trembling with fear, and a lot of them are starting to leave. They said, I'm out of here. I'm, I'm, they just took on off, went back home. So there you are, Saul. What do you do? God said, do not attack until Samuel comes and until Samuel offers a burnt offering to the Lord. And he's got to wait seven days for Samuel to come. And it's been seven days, and there's no Samuel to be seen. So what do you do? What do you do? Do you wait on God, or do you take matters into your own hands and do what you think is best under the circumstances? Well, you know the story. Saul jumps the gun. He says, man, I'm done waiting. I'm tired of waiting. It's, it's, this is getting critical. This is getting dangerous. People are leaving. I don't know what to do. And it, he figures it'd be better under these circumstances, it's better for me to go ahead and offer the sacrifice myself instead of waiting for slowpoke Samuel. Can't wait for him any longer. We've got to get this show on the road. We've got to get going here. And so verse 9, Saul, off, Saul, not Samuel, Saul offered up the burnt offering just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done, asked Samuel. Saul replied, well, you, you, when, I, when I saw that the men were scattering and, and you didn't come at the set time, and you know, the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. I've, I've not sought the Lord's favor, so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. God said, wait, and Saul wouldn't do it. Sometimes we do that too, don't we? Every kind of gone before God, kind of tired of waiting on doing his way. You know, some, some of us say, well, you know, God says wait until marriage before we're physically intimate, but, but that's kind of ridiculous. I mean, you know, why do I need to wait? I mean, come on, we, we love each other, and it seems so right, and everybody's, I, I don't know what the big deal is. Here's the big deal. Here's the big deal. You're not waiting on God. And when we don't wait on God, when we just decide to take matters into our own hands, when we decide that we're going to do what we want to do in spite of what God has clearly said to do in His Word, it can lead to some horrendous, painful, long-lasting consequences. And if you don't believe me, just ask Saul. Here's another problem with Saul's heart. And it's this, he didn't obey God. Another time in chapter 15, God had given Saul just explicit instructions to not take any spoil. They're going into battle, and you're going to win, but don't take any spoil, not anything, nothing, not one animal, not one person, not one possession, nothing. Don't take anything. So Saul goes into battle, just like God said they would. They win, and Saul's looking around and says, you know, we've won this battle. We beat, beat the Philistines, and... Look at all these sheep, you know, they're just sheep, and we could eat them. We could feed our hungry people. I don't see anything wrong with just keeping them for, my, for myself. So Samuel comes up and tells Saul that once again, you've blown it. You've blown it. You've disobeyed God. And when Samuel is confronting Saul with his disobedience, uh, Saul tells Samuel exactly why he did it. Verse 34, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command on your instructions. I was afraid of the people, so I gave in to them. What was Saul's problem? He was more concerned about having the approval of people than having the approval of God. Saul was more worried about what people were going to think than he was worried about what God was going to think. He was afraid that people might reject him. He's thinking that people might think less of him. He was more concerned about people's opinions than God's opinions. You know, peer pressure, boy, Robert's talking about it. peer pressure is tough, especially for you kids in school. And maybe you're worried, understandably so, about what, what other kids are going to think, you know, if you don't take that drink, if you don't participate in using those drugs. If, you know, are they going to worry about, what, what are they going to think if I don't let them cheat off my paper? You know, maybe I'll be rejected. You know, what are they going to think if I don't join in the gossip, join in the bad language, join in all the stuff they're doing? But listen. When you and I, adults, children, any of us, when we make decisions based on the approval of others, we're acting like Saul. 
people are acting just like Saul. And our hearts, that means they're just not really where they need to be. Fourth problem in Saul's heart, he never learned to trust God. A few weeks, we're going to be looking at 1 Samuel 17 with the whole story of David and Goliath. And, and granted, Goliath is a scary dude. Nine feet tall, heavily armored, seasoned warrior. He comes out. He's taunting the Israelites. Hey, bring your best soldier out here, and I'll fight him. And if, and if I win, y'all obey us. And if we win, uh, you'll obey us. Vice versa, you got it. Anyway, he's taunting these Israelites, but, but we see Saul's heart in verse 11. You know, here's Goliath, and we see verse 11. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. You see, Saul focused on the giant problem instead of on the greatness of his God. Consequently, he was dismayed. He was terrified. He never really learned to trust God with the challenges and with the difficulties that faced him in life. Here's the deal. He faced life as if there was no God. You know, he's kind of a functional atheist, okay? He acknowledged God with his words, but he lived his, wa- his life in such a way as if God didn't really exist. And then the fifth problem with Saul's heart was that he would not genuinely repent of his sins. You know, when Saul sinned, yeah, he, would, he was quick to say, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, but he always had an excuse, a rationalization, a reason. Well, this is why I had to do it. And it seems like the thing he was more worried about than anything or more sorry about than anything was the fact that he got gotten caught, was the fact that he's going to have to pay some consequences. But you never, ever get the sense when you're reading about Saul that his he had a heartfelt, genuine sorrow in his heart concerning his sins. So in summary, it kind of seems like God had the same kind of issue or problem with Saul as Jesus had with the Pharisees. Because in Matthew 15, Jesus turned to the Pharisees and says, "Uh, you hypocrites, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. And here's the deal. Here's how they're similar. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far away from me. That's Saul's heart. That's what it looks like. Okay, let's shift gears. Now let's look at David's heart. Now, what happened is when Samuel arrived on the scene to see that Saul had not waited for God, but had offered the offering, he says to him, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the command the Lord gave you. Listen to this. Now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought a man. Listen to the description of the guy that God has sought. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of his people because you have not obeyed the Lord's command. What was God looking for? A man after God's own heart. And that's precisely the kind of heart that David had. But what does that really mean, to have a a man after God's own heart? Chuck Swindoll says it well. He says this, What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Seems to me it means that you are a person whose life is in harmony with the Lord. What's important to him is important to you. What burdens him burdens you. When he says go to the right, you go to the right. When he says stop that in your life, you stop it. It means you are sensitive to the things of God. Good description. So let's examine five characteristics then of David, a man after God's own heart. First of all, he was humble. He was humble. After God rejects Saul from being a king, he tells Samuel that he selected a new king from the family of a man by the name of Jesse. And Jesse lived in this little town, this old little town called Bethlehem, okay? So Samuel goes to Bethlehem, and Jesse introduces him proudly to his seven sons, you know, thinking one of them is, might be the one God has chosen to be the new king. First son stands up, the the firstborn, Eliab, striking-looking guy, tall, rugged. He's a soldier. He looks like the kind of guy that people would want to follow. And God says, nope, that's not him. He's not the one. Verse 7, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height For I have not chosen him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. This is so good. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. That's what God's looking at. Bingo. That's what God's interested in. He's interested in you you and me. And church, don't miss this. Right now, as you're listening to this message, as I'm preaching, God is looking at your heart. 
He's got x-ray vision. He sees right in there. He knows exactly what's going on in your heart and mine. So Samuel said, well, okay, Eliab's not the one. And so Jesse said, well, how about this one? No, he's not the one. How about this one? Goes through all seven sons. None of them are there. And then Samuel says, are these all the sons you've got? She said, well, you know, there's David. (laughs) A little teenage kid, just, you know, he's, he's out there tending the sheep, but, but, you know, you're not interested in him. Sam said, go get him. Bring him in. He walks in the door. God says, that's the one. Anoint him. He's the next king of Israel. Wow. Now, telling a kid brother, a shepherd boy, the one that his dad never even remotely considered was king material, telling him that he's been anointed to be the king over the whole nation of Israel, that could tend to go to a kid's head. Yeah, you know, he could be a little cocky about that. He can kind of start talking to his brothers in a little bit different way. Listen to how Swindoll says about David's response to being the anointed one. What did he do? He did not go down to the nearest department store and try on crowns. He didn't order a new set of business cards telling the printer, change it from shepherd to king elect. He didn't have a badge saying, I'm the new man. He didn't shine up a chariot and race through the streets of Bethlehem yelling, I'm God's choice. You're looking at Saul's replacement. That that wasn't at all the kind of response he had. You know what he did? He went back to the sheep. Continue to mess with those dirty, smelly sheep is one of the lowliest jobs you could have. It was demanding. It was lowly esteemed, no prestige. And, and, and so he just went back to the sheep. He's anointed king. He went back to the sheep. That's how humble he was. And then later, the, the King Saul is going to have some major mood swings. He's going through all kinds of problems. He hears that this young shepherd boy named David, and he can really play the harp. He's really good. So he commissions him, come on in, play for me. So David's there playing his harp for the guy that he's replacing. The guy, the guy says, David, you're king, not him. And here he is, no, he's playing the harp for Saul. You see, a part of what made David have a, have a heart after God was his humility. He had a servant's heart. And when you've got a servant's heart, you're humble, and you do what you're told to do, and you don't rebel against God, and you show respect for the people who are in charge over you, and you serve faithfully and quietly without drawing a whole lot of attention to yourself. That's David. That's David. Another God-pleasing thing about David's heart is he was willing, unlike Saul, to wait on the Lord. Here's David. Clearly, by the number one guy in the country, he's been anointed by God, you know, through using Samuel, to be the king of Israel. But he had to wait 15 years before he became the king. And for seven of those years, he was hounded by Saul, who was desperately uh, wicked and jealous of him, and one had the whole army chasing David, trying to kill him as quickly as they had. Two different occasions, David had him right there. He could have killed him. And his men said, go do it. God has delivered him in your hands. Doesn't listen to the crowd. Doesn't cave into the peer pressure. He listens to his Lord. He waits on the Lord. Now, just think. Saul couldn't wait. Seven days for Samuel. David waited 15 years to become king. And that's a heart that beats for God. That's the kind of heart that's far more interested in in God's approval than in the approval of others. Next quality. He was a man of integrity. Now, David happened to have a music director. His name was Asaph. You know, Jordy is our Asaph, okay? And he wrote one of the Psalms, Psalm 78. And listen to what Asaph says in verses 70 to 72. God chose David, his servant, and took him from the sheep pens. From tending the sheep, he brought him to be the shepherd of his people, Jacob of Israel, his inheritance. Listen to this. And David shepherded them with integrity of heart. With skillful hands, he led them. And that little word in the Hebrew for integrity means full. It means undivided. In other words, David didn't just say he loved God with his lips. Man, he lived it out with his life. He didn't just look good on the outside. No, he, he, his, his walk was genuine to the core of his being. David didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. Here's another thing about David's heart. He was obedient. He was obedient. 
You know, one of Paul's sermons, he's given a sermon in Antioch, Pisidia, and, and he, in Acts 13 he says this, kind of rehearsing the, the history of Israel. After removing Saul, God made David their king. He testified concerning him, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And, this is what he adds, he will do everything I want him to do. That's the kind of heart David had. Now, did David make mistakes? Oh, yeah, he made mistakes. He made some whoppers. He made some really big mistakes. But here's the difference. He always came back to God. He always came back. In his heart, in the very core of his being, he wanted to please God with his life. That's what drove him. He wanted to be God's man. Well, listen, let me ask you a question. Why do you think we obey God when we've had these different situations? Well, we obey God when we believe that God knows best. Isn't that true? We obey, God knows best, okay, I'm, I'm going to do that. We disobey God when we think we know best. So Saul thought he knew best. David, time and again, showed that he thought that God knew best. Now think about it. I want you to think about the last time you can remember disobeying God. You know, something he asked you to do, something he asked you not to do and, or led you to do. The reason you disobeyed, ask yourself, could it be that we think we're smarter than God? Could we think, you know, we know what's right in this situation, not God. We think we're up to date. God's out of date. But how pleasing. How just unbelievably pleasing it is to God when we obey God and say, you know, Lord, I don't understand it. I really don't. And I don't, I don't really see why this is that big of a deal, but I love you, God, and I trust you. And I know that you really want the very best for me, so, Lord, I'm going to obey you. That's having a heart for God. Fifth beautiful thing about David's heart was that he faced life with faith. That's kind of a tongue twister, but he faced life with faith. You know, when David was chosen to be the king, you don't find him hiding out in the suitcases. He took on that role of Israel's king. He's trusting that God was going to empower him to be able to do what he needed to do. And when David stood with a slingshot in front of that nine-foot giant, he wasn't terrified. He wasn't dis dismayed. Everybody else was, but he wasn't because he faced that giant problem with faith in a much greater, a lot bigger God. You know, yesterday, Saturday, was a really unusual day for me. I started off the day, you know, uh, one of the first things that happened, I was talking to Bill Page on the phone. He called and and he called to let me know that his wife, Claudia, who we've been praying for, has these, these liver problems and needs to get a liver. She died yesterday. Died the day before. And Bill wasn't panicked. He wasn't dismayed. He didn't think that God had deserted him or let him down. He didn't shake his fist at God. Instead, facing the death of his wife with faith, he had a peace of God that, that just transcends human understanding. And, of course, I told him, look, man, you don't need to come. Wait, look, God's going to provide somebody else. You really you don't need, don't think you have to come down to our men's retreat. But again, walking in faith, he said, no, Bill, I've really prayed about this. And I have canceled a speeching engagement for this weekend. But God's put in my heart, I'm supposed to be there. He wants me to come down and be the speaker for your men's retreat. That's facing life with faith. And that is a mark of a, a heart that beats for God. Well, after that conversation, uh, uh, Julie and I headed over to Oshner's to spend some time with the Bagalas, and, and we didn't really know what was going to happen, but it was amazing to see Peggy and to see her family face the death of Shelby with faith. And, of course, they were sad that Shelby died. And, of course, there were tears. Of course, they will miss him terribly, but they were accepting God's will and God's plan for Shelby's life. And in faith, they trusted that Shelby was securely in God's hands. They faced life and death with faith. And that's the mark of a person who has a heart after God. Saul sinned. So did David. But the difference was that for David, number six, when he sinned, he wouldn't remain in the sin, but would genuinely repent. 
When David sinned, he wouldn't remain in it. He would genuinely repent. Now, we need to understand that having a heart after God doesn't mean you don't sin. It doesn't mean you don't make mistakes. Sometimes we make terrible mistakes. But having, what having a heart for God does mean is that when you do sin, you don't remain in that sin. You don't keep swimming in that pool. And it means that you're not, uh, you're not able to be comfortable with that sin. It makes you feel bad. You, you don't want to stay there. You want to confess that sin. You want to repent it. You plead with God, give me the strength to not commit that sin again. You see, having a heart for God means that when you sin, you're not just sorry you got caught. You're not just sorry because, oh, I'm going to have to pay some consequences. No, it, having a heart for God, it, it means that you're sorry that you've grieved the heart of God. And that you know, you know that sin's been fully forgiven. You know that that sin, whatever it is, has been fully covered by the blood of Christ. But you're so sorry that your sin has broken your sweet fellowship with God. And you can't stand that. That feels so awful. Yeah, and so you confess that sin. You repent that sin because you love God more than anything else. And the very last thing in the world you want to do is to be out of fellowship with him. That's the way David was. He committed some real whoppers of sin. And after his sin with Bathsheba, he humbly comes before God and sincerely prays. You need to read Psalm 51. You need to read Psalm 32, these beautiful psalms of genuine repentance. But in verse 10 of Psalm 51, he says, Oh, God created me a pure heart, undivided in devotion to you. Oh, God, renew a steadfast spirit in me. Genuinely repenting of our sin, that's a mark of a heart that beats for God. And then it almost goes without saying, probably the chief characteristic of David having a heart after God is that he loved God with all of his heart. He loved God wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly. And you just can't miss it when you read through the Psalms. You know, David's just wholehearted love for God just comes flowing out of the spring of his heart. Listen, just a brief sampling. Uh, 103, Psalm 103, verse 1. David says, praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Psalm 34, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And on and on we read. Okay, we've done the heart examination. We've examined Saul's heart and kind of seen what it's like. We've kind of looked at David's heart and kind of seen what that's like. Now it's time to put those little sticky things on our chest and do an EKG and look at our own hearts. And to do that, look in your bulletins. There's a little half sheet, and it's got eight little uh, different scales there. And these are eight different things we've kind of talked about this morning about where your heart is. Now, here's, I do have a homework assignment for you. And if you wait till Monday to do it, you probably won't do it. So let's do it today, over lunch, this afternoon, tonight, whatever. But read that little list, and here's the assignment. I want you to put an X on each line that shows where you are in each of these categories. Nobody has to see this but you. And I want you to put an X, listen to this, not where you'd like it to be, not where you think it's supposed to be. I want you to be real honest and put an X where it actually truthfully is. And have the kind of courage that David has in Psalm 139 when he says, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my anxious thoughts, and see if there's any hurtful way in me. So you've got this little scale on one side, confidence mostly in your own abilities, and the other side, confidence first and foremost in God. Where are you on a scale of one to ten? Are you a five and a half, or four, or three, or ten, or one? The next one, impatience with God and his timing. And the other side, able to wait on the Lord no matter what. Disobey God, obey God, unable to trust God, unswerving trust in God. I rationalize my sins away. I repent of my sins. Self-serving, humble servant. I lack integrity or I'm full of integrity. No love for God, that's what Saul was like. Half-hearted love for God, that's really what David's son Solomon was like. Or wholehearted love for God, that's what David was like. Where do you fit in there? Now, before we close, I want you to listen to something very carefully because it might be that you're here today and and boy you're truth being I, I you just feel like i don't have a heart for god 
And the reason you don't have a heart for God might be because you've never really asked Jesus to come into your life and to to be your Savior. And here's the truth. The truth is that we are all born with this incurable heart disease called sin. And with sin in our hearts on our own, we can never, ever even dream of having a heart for God. In fact, because of our sins, unless something's done about it, we'd spend eternity separated from God. You see, here's the deal. Every single one of us, none of us here, we need a better heart. We need a new heart, brand new heart. And the only way we get a new heart is when we accept Christ to come into our lives and be our Savior. So I want to give you an opportunity to do just that right now if you would like to. So would you all please bow your heads? This is going to be a very private thing. You won't have to raise your hand. You won't have to come forward. But this is just between you and God. So if you'd like to accept Christ and have a heart transplant, have a brand new heart, be a new creature in Christ, I encourage you with all of my heart to just spend the next few minutes talking with God. Now, these are not just trite little words. This is not a religious formula. It's simply coming to God and talking to him and accepting his free gift of salvation. If that's what you want to do, please just silently say this to him. Dear God, I thank you for bringing me here today. I confess that my heart is not right with you. I realize I've made mistakes. I know I've not always done what you want me to do. But God, thank you for loving me so much that you were willing to do something about my sins. Thank you, God, for sending your son Jesus into this world to pay for my sins. God, I believe that Jesus' death on the cross paid for every single sin I will ever commit or ever have committed. So God, right now, as I sit here in your presence in the stillness and the quietness of this sanctuary, I'm asking you to come into my life and be my Lord and my Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for doing that. Thanks for coming into my life. I pray that you will now begin to change me And slowly but surely, help me to have a heart that really beats for you. And Father, for those of us who already know you and have you in our lives, we know there are plenty of areas in which our heart needs to change. Father, that little scale we're we're filling out is pretty convicting. But thank you for loving us. Thank you for not giving up on us. And God, I pray that this year you will help every single one of us to have humble hearts, hearts that trust you implicitly, hearts that love you enough to wait on you even when it's really hard to do that. Help us to have hearts that long to obey you and to trust you and to serve you. Help us, Father, to be a people who love you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our strength. And in the name of your son, Jesus, who died so that we could live, we pray it. Amen.